Um, so it's my pleasure today to welcome Warren Sack, who is visiting from uh, UC Santa Cruz today. And um, you know, Warren's really one of these people who sits at the intersection of a lot of fields and disciplines that relate to new media uh, and communications. And you can see this from his list of uh, units that he's affiliated <laughs> with in Santa Cruz, which is pretty impressive. And, um, I think what's so interesting about Warren's work is, um, you know, from his training at the Media Lab, you know, he's really brought in a lot of perspectives that bring together sort of a fairly geeky technical expertise with, you know, a more social and politically motivated kinds of um, activities as well as a cool design sensibility. And it's really, um, his projects are really an integration of all these different layers, which I find is incredibly rare and is also incredibly <laughs> difficult to pull off. Um, and because of that, Warren and I also have multiple points of intersection, so I've been a hybrid of a slightly different flavor, but you know, we've been sort of viewing each other's work across this you know, similarly configured kind of networks. And so you, know, you probably know that Warren will be speaking over an interactive tomorrow night, and I think it's a different, it's a diff very different topic probably from what you're talking about today. So you can see the multiple sides of the hybrid entities by going to two talks. Um, but then we've also intersected institutionally, like um, you know, Warren was involved in the iSchool, which is where I also ran some of my own ethnographic projects. So we have overlapping students, even though our fields at first blush may seem quite different. So I think it's a good indication of sort of how these hybrid networks are informing each other. And I think in a lot of ways, that's some of what we'll be hearing today from Warren. So thank you. Thank you for inviting me. So in the, in the range of hanging out to geeking out, we might be, I might be more in the geeking out today. Um, where are you all from? We're, we're not that many people. Can, can you just tell me, like, are you coming from USC? If you are, like, which parts of USC? So I met you folks in the front. USC Cinema Interactive Media and Media Arts and Practice. All right, yeah. I'm USC, uh, Computer Science. Uh, computer Science? Okay. Annenberg, USC uh -huh. Annenberg. Yeah. Annenberg. Annenberg, uh-huh. Uh, USC Media Arts and Practice. Uh-huh. Right. Geography? All right. Uh, USC Cinema Production. Uh-huh. And USC Cinema Institute for Multimedia University. Right. And I'm at the Communication School and I'm in a big tank that studies the community. Right. Um, I'm in Cinema Media Arts and Practice. And I'm in Rome. Rio Cirova? Right. Wow. Well, thank you. I just, um, it's, you have quite an eclectic group here as, as well. I, I, I think one way <coughs> uh, to understand what I'm trying to do today is, uh, is just book promotion. <laughs> um, there was a group of us uh, headed by Matthew Fuller that put out this thing uh, last spring from MIT Press called Software Studies, a Lexicon. And then um, we've since even got <clears throat> more serious about it. MIT Press is going to make this a book series. Um, we had a meeting, um, <clears throat> Lev Manovich and uh, Noah Wardrip Fruin, who just moved from San Diego to Santa Cruz. Um, the two of them down at San Diego in June had a meeting for all of us to get together again. Um, so there's kind of a lot of people in the works here trying to write books around this notion of software studies. So I'm going to try and define what software studies is. And also, I guess what I'm aiming towards in my talk today is what's the interface uh, between software studies and what I know about what you all do here at the, the, at the Institute. Um, I'm reading that through Mimi's work, I guess, and I'm, I'm trying to find like, what, what's the interface there. Because I, I think there's a difference, but I, I think there's... Um, I mean, the, the, my, my, I guess the end is I, I think it's a complement. I don't think it's the same thing, but I think it's a complement. So this is the outline. Um, I want to describe what I consider the situation. Um, and this may be sort of much too um, 
overarching, but um, it's a way of setting the scene. I want to define what software studies is, and I especially want to articulate what's, what's the intersection of software studies and computer science. And then, because we're talking about literacy, we're talking about literacy today, um, I, I think there's something quite different about being uh, literate today. And that has to do with differentiating programs from prose. State of knowledge for the government of Quebec, Jean-Francois Lyotard predicted an immediate future in which, quote, the direction of new research will be dictated by the possibility of its eventual results being translated into computer language. The producers and users of knowledge must now and will have to possess the means of translating into these languages whatever they want to learn. Leotard labeled his diagnosis that we have turned away from other languages, especially narrative language, to computer languages, computer languages as the human mind functions. So for cognitive scientists, people are computers. For molecular biologists, the genetic code is a computer code, and so forth. These are not fanciful leaps of faith, but literal beliefs held by large groups of scientists who work according to a scientific method. And I will label this digital ideology to distinguish this effect of computers from something far more pervasive. Digital life leaks outside of professional circles and flows beyond the technical vocabularies of specialist dialogues. So consider these examples of today's computers and networks that flaunt yesterday's common sense, yet constitute unremarkable conditions of digital life. And this is just I barely need to give you all who study <clears throat> many things about digital life. It's not, it's not only possible, but usual for someone to be in two places at once. If you're chatting online with someone far away, you're both at your computer and online. In a world of GPS-enabled cell phones, getting lost will be a strange and difficult to understand event. When we all carry cell phones, where the prefix numbers designate only where we bought the phone, not where we reside, then losing touch with friends and family will be a sin, not a hardship. Imagine what a bizarre story the Odyssey will seem to be for a generation that grows up with GPS-enabled cell phones. How could Odysseus get lost for 10 years and never send word to his wife? Some of the main tropes of Western literature, the quest, the long lost brother, and so forth, will become almost incomprehensible, or at least very strange, to future generations. Now, after many years developing software for analytic seismic data for oil exploration, first for Exxon and then for startup companies subsequently acquired by Halliburton, Dr. Harold Hildebrand turned his digital signal processing skills on music. He founded Antares Audio Technologies and then in 1997 released a piece of software called AutoTune, a program that can corrects pitch problems in vocals and other solo instruments. In 1998, the recording engineers for Cher remixed her song Believe, using an extreme setting for autotune that brought attention to the special effect. And you probably know this, but the visuals actually correspond to what's happening in the audio pretty well. There's the effect, both visually and audio. <laughs> so the pitch corrector, give it sort of a, a, a target and you're going to shift the pitch to that target regardless of where it is. So visually you're almost seeing the same thing, it's just being shifted across the screen when they're applying that. So Believe became a best-selling song, Auto-Tune quickly became the largest selling plug-in of all time. Its nickname is the Share Effect. Madonna used it in her 2000 music um, album. Now we hear this really all, all the time, right, in top 40 radio. Lil Wayne's uh, rap lollipop um, is one of the more recent ones that uses that setting. Um. <clears throat> so you listen to any top 40 radio station in the United States and you'll hear that most of the singers that have been remastered with some digital effect, not necessarily 
auto-tune, but some. And it's completely unremarkable that singers are now cyborgs rather than soloists. So nevertheless, despite the fact that this is our common experience, um, it is unfortunately not common knowledge. These examples illustrate how the digital is not just a condition of scientific knowledge, but rather extends the, its effects into everyday life by changing what is common sense and common experience. In other words, digital ideology and digital life are widespread but not widely understood. Together, digital ideology and digital life are two results of the digital reformatting of our world, a rewriting process in which everything and everyone is being rearticulated with computer programming languages. All is being written, rewritten, or linked together with software. And I'm <coughs> relying on this distinction, which I will do for the rest of the presentation, but that I want to kind of blur at the end of my presentation. It's a distinction between digital ideology and digital life. Um, it's conceptually clear, but empirically blurry. I mean, uh, Mimi's article entitled Technologies of the Childhood Imagination Yu-Gi-Oh! Media Mixes and Everyday Cultural Production sort of illustrates how an activity of digital life, namely the Yu-Gi-Oh! game, interfaces, interfaces fact and fiction, childhood and adulthood, and even health and pathology. And these workings are the workings of digital ideology. So I'll return to this blurred boundary between life and ideology at the end of my talk, but right now I want to maintain this distinction, employing ideology in a matter akin to what Destut de Tracy meant when he introduced the term in 18th century France. Ideology is the study of the ideas, frequently invisible to everyday life, that structure and frame everyday life. For, uh, for fish, then digital ideology is the water that we swim in. So, <clears throat> what is software studies? In a nutshell, software constitutes an ideological and a material force that's changing intellectual and everyday life. Software studies is a means to examine these changes. To describe what a study of the rewriting of the world would entail, it can be compared to previous projects of social science and the humanities. Thus, one might argue that digital ideology and digital life are further extensions of instrumental reason. Max Weber, and then afterwards, most prominently, members of the Frankfurt School examined how everyday life, thought, and action are being increasingly structured by instrumental reason. That is, means, ends, analysis, in which the ends are given, and effort is uniquely applied to discovering the means to those ends. In the book Dialectic of Enlightenment, um, Horkheimer and Adorno saw this rise of instrumental reason as a self-destruction of the Enlightenment. Their student Habermas contrasts instrumental rationality with communicative rationality. Analysis versus rationality applied to form, forming a consensus between people. So ironically, if you know how much Leotard disliked Habermas, the quote I started with from Leotard, the idea that we're losing narrative language to instrumental language of computer science could be understood in Habermas's terms as a loss of communicative rationality to instrumental rationality. Consequently, software studies could be accomplished as a project that extends the insights into instrumental reason, extends those of Weber and the Frankfurt School into digital domains, where alternatively, as uh, Tiziana Terranova's work illustrates, um, She's got a wonderful book just called Network Cultures. One might expand Marxist theories of labor and capital to encompass the expanses of the online world. But both of these directions would require that one abandon all support for computers. It works right from the very beginning of the inquiry. Instrumental reason, the division of labor, and principles of automation are all specific developments of the Enlightenment. The stage direction of the Frankfurt School and Marx would require one to be against these developments. But Michel Foucault, in his short essay, What is Enlightenment?, offers both an indirect critique of Adorno and Horkheimer and an alternative path to. So Foucault writes, one does not have to be for or against the Enlightenment. 
Rather, we must try to proceed with the analysis of ourselves as beings who are historically determined to a certain extent by the Enlightenment. Such an analysis implies a series of historical inquiries that are as precise as possible. And these inquiries will not be oriented respectively towards the essential kernel of rationality that can be found in the Enlightenment. They will be Foucault's emphasis <coughs> on change, what has changed, what can today be changed, resonates well with what Matthew Fuller. <coughs> Matthew's term for change is hackability. He says, when technology is used in a way that is interrogable or hackable, it allows and encourages those networked or enmeshed within it to gain traction on its multiple scales of operation. Hackability is not in itself a magic bullet. It relies on skills, knowledge, and access of making things public and changing them in the process. Gathering together forms of knowledge that, that couple software with other kinds of thinking is hopefully a way of enlarging the capacity of hackability itself to be hacked from all directions. So coupled together, Foucault and Fuller's suggestions entail a method for software studies. It is first an analysis of ourselves as imbricated in the machinery of computers and networks. What are the, quote, contemporary limits of the necessary? When we operate like a machine or vice versa? For example, what connotations are associated with an algorithm when it's performed by someone rather than something? Thus, we can consider the ethics of, for example, product placement as performed by search engines and newspapers, even if a machine rather than a human editor is lacing information with advertising. Computer science looks at the, quote, essential kernel of rationality that makes people and machines functionally equivalent. In contrast, social software studies requires us to look for what gets lost in the translation from human to machine. Is there any difference between Tom Sawyer and a Web 2.0 service? What's the difference between Tom's successful efforts to get his neighbors to paint Aunt Polly's fence by convincing them that work is play and the efforts of a Web 2.0 service that profits by converting people's leisure into a form of capital? Second, a method of software studies needs to consider history, especially historical contingencies, quote, unnecessary details of development that made us and our technologies what we and they are today. What are the presuppositions made long ago, the design accidents, the unwarranted decisions that were made and continue to persist in contemporary technology and subjectivity? For example, why is the contemporary graphical user interface a desktop? Perhaps it's not a coincidence. Maybe computing is simply the continuation of bureaucracy by other means and does not and never has had any potential as a democratic medium. The sort of history is of a very particular kind, termed by Foucault both archaeological and genealogical. Third, in terms of method, as Foucault wrote, such work needs to, quote, both to grasp the points where change is possible and desirable and to determine the precise form this change should take. Students of software need to be experimental. We need to be, in Fuller's words, hacking. And one should expect that any method of software studies should also include the design and implementation of software to determine the precise form changes should take. If one is to do a study of a search engine software, part of that study should also be the design and implementation of an alternative search engine, or at least the construction of computational means that can be used to interrogate the processes of searching. And I just for the social scientists, I should just mention that I think this third methodological point accords uh, with what has most recently been called digital methods. I'm thinking about my colleague at the University of Amsterdam, Richard Rogers' work um, around these kinds of things. Um, so, my next point. I'm trying to... I'm trying to articulate what this whole thing is about. This is a, a little bit tricky because I'm sort of trying to tell you what's implied by the work of doing software studies, differentiate it from these other things, but not give you an example of software studies, which I hope um, my talk tomorrow will be able to kind of unveil some of that. But um, I do uh, 
want to mention again that I'm more or less promoting the book. So there's all kinds of software studies in the in the book. Um, I don't know if it's exactly what we what I want is software studies, just like any first work um, is not necessarily hitting uh, the whole category um, that w it will eventually attain. You, know, you can think of early work in cultural studies uh, where people didn't really didn't pay attention to the audience, right? And now we'd say, well, what about the audience? But that old stuff by Raymond Williams and stuff, you'd say, well, no, that's, that's the beginnings. Um, so I don't know if it's software studies, but there are at least examples there that, that we could call that. So let me differentiate, attempt to differentiate, because I, I <coughs> end up in muddled territory here as well, between computer science and software studies. So just as software studies as an endeavor might be compared to earlier work in the humanities and social sciences, alternatively, computer, uh, software studies can be productively compared to a specific current of computer science. A specific current of computer science considers itself a writing practice and as such is tantamount to a form of software studies, a kind of work that incorporates all three of the methodological points outlined above. Now, Hal Abelson and, and Jerry Sussman wrote an introductory programming textbook for their undergraduate computer science students at MIT. Their textbook, The Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs, embodies this alternative form of computer science. But it's also one of the most popular textbooks and it's been adopted by computer science departments around the world. Sussman and Abelson write in their introduction, quote, underlying our approach to this subject is our conviction that computer science is not a science and that it significantly has, and its significance has little to do with also one of the most popular textbooks and it's been adopted by computer science departments around the world. Sussman and Abelson write in their introduction, quote, underlying our approach to this subject is our conviction that computer science is not a science and that it significantly has, and its significance has little to do with from computation, what is, as distinguished from how to, Abelson and Sussman articulate a third position of procedural epistemology. In their book, they emphasize one aspect of epistemology, that computation constitutes a new way of thinking. Other important computer scientists highlight this new way of thinking in their writings about education. Alan Kay insists that, quote, the real computer revolution hasn't happened yet. His point is that while computer technology is abundant in science, engineering, business settings, and consumer intern items, its impor import has yet to be felt in the educational system. Kay says the real computer revolution will happen when children learn a new way of thinking using computer programs as models and means for exploring art and science. In evoking revolution, computer scientist Edward Dijkstra more humbly states, quote, one of the more, most important aspects of any computing tool is its influence on the thinking habits of those who try to use it. So I, I think this is in alignment with one of the three philosophies of educational software that Mimi identifies in her PhD dissertation, namely the constructivist philosophy that descends from Jean Piaget and that we hear about from this country, usually through Seymour Papert. Um, pragmatically, this form of computer science has been pursued with a mixture of methods that weaves together ideas from the arts, the humanities, and mathematics. Donald Knuth, Professor Emeritus of the Art of Computer Programming at Stanford University advocates a method he calls literate programming. Quote, let us change our at traditional attitude to the construction of programs. Instead of imagining that our main task is to instruct a computer what to do, let us concentrate rather on explaining to human beings what we want a computer to do. The practitioner of literate programming can be regarded as an essayist, whose main concern is the exposition and excellence of style. Knuth, in other words, sees programming as an art and a literature, and practitioners of procedural epistemology are essayists, writers, and expositions in his um, exposition. So for Alan Kay, Donald Knuth, Edgar Dykstra, Alan Perlis, Hal Abelson, Jerry Sussman, and some of the other most important computer scientists in the world, computing is a new form of writing. 
Methodologically, this practice more closely resembles the arts and the humanities than it does empirical science. And of course, the other side of this whole debate is um, seen in um, Alan Newell and um, Herbert Simon's uh, Turing Award lecture where they insist that computing is an empirical science and more or less um, that discussion is still going on. Now, <clears throat> if this is about writing, I think that's in some ways just too easy of an analogy. Um, there's writing and then there's writing. Um, and we're changing languages radically when we talk about programming languages. So I want to emphasize this point simply by pointing out some differences between programs and prose. Programming languages are not a small change in the practice of writing. They're enormous. They constitute an apocal shift in what counts as knowledge and what can be known. Leotard and other theorists of the information society have pointed out the economic, political, and societal implications of this shift. Practitioners and thinkers of procedural epistemology have documented how profoundly this new form of writing has changed their own thinking and could change education. But while writing a computer program is analogous to previous forms of writing, it's only analogous. It's as analogous as writing a letter is to speaking on the phone, or as similar as a novel is to a film made from a novel. By examining some of the differences between human languages and computer programming languages, let's expand on this analogy and look for its fissures. Imperative. First, when we write in English, or French, or whatever, we employ various verb tenses, the past, the present, the future, the subjunctive, and so forth. But a computer programmer is more or less limited to two senses. The imperative, do this, and the conditional, if this, then that. So from a certain perspective, computer languages are diminished forms of language. In George Orwell's novel 1984, he introduced Newspeak as the official language of the future, a language in which the vocabulary was drastically reduced to assist Big Brother's control of the population's thoughts. The target of Orwell's parody, Newspeak, was basic English, an attempt to create a word, world language containing fewer than 850 words that was promoted by the BBC in the 1930s. Now, ironically, Orwell was one of the broadcast producers who promoted basic English to India via the BBC until he, Orwell, decided it was a mechanism for limiting thought. Like Newspeak, all computer languages are artificial languages designed to have precise and limited semantics. In particular, computer languages only allow one to write step-by-step -step procedures. While it may be possible, for example, to write a procedure to narrate a story, it's not possible to write a narrative in a computer language. Autonomous. Second, while one can give someone else an order or a command in a human language, the computer programmer's instructions do not need anyone to carry them out. Writing computer code is more like building a machine than like composing a letter. Once the code is written, it can be executed autonomously by the computer or analogously, it's like writing a recipe where each step of the recipe requires no intervention from the cook. Knead the dough, set it aside, and let it rise. Or bake the pie, then let it cool for 10 minutes before serving. The rising and the cooling are self-executing steps of a recipe. Neither true, for example, definitions which associate noun phrases with the people and corporate entities mentioned in a legal contract. However, computer code, legal code, social protocols, and the executive and judicial branches of the government can all work together to effectively bind the variables of a computer program together with specific people. But it takes <coughs> an amalgam of languages. So consider your credit rating as it's represented by a large database of ratings or think of your entry in your employer's payroll system or even your profile on Facebook, Orkut, or LinkedIn. The computer program represents you insofar, insofar as a legal, juridical, executive, or social protocol uses the computer's data structures as a reference to you. And we see the fault lines of heterogeneous systems like this when they fail. For example, the Columbia Benefits Management System has, uh, I'm sorry, the Colorado, the state of Colorado 
uh, benefits management system has issued hundreds of thousands of incorrect Medicaid food stamp and welfare eligibility determinations and benefit calculations since its launch in September of 2004. Binding. Incorrect bindings. <clears throat> Infinitesimal. Fourth, materially, computer programs are written at a microscopic level, a level that's impossible to see with the naked eye. If one, for instance, burns the text of a book onto a blank CD, it's impossible to read the book by looking at the CD. Even if some new formatting techniques emerged that rendered text onto the CD in letters rather than with ones and zeros, a burned CD would still be unreadable because its inscription is too small for human acuity. The infinitesimal character of computer language has benefits and liabilities. Its small size is what makes it possible for one to store what would have been previously considered an entire library of books on even a small laptop. But this effective miniaturization of language is also what makes viruses and spyware possible. Things can be effectively hidden or a hard on a hard drive because relatively speaking, even a small hard drive comprises an enormous space. Illegible. Here is the first line of code one sees when one opens the Microsoft Word application in a plain text editor. To a trained computer programmer, this is illegible. It's likely only coincidence that the first four characters, joy, look like a cry of exaltation in English. Microsoft applications like Excel are released as executables. That is to say, they can be run, executed, directly by the computer. Computer code is generally written by someone and then compiled or interpreted by another piece of software so that the computer code is rendered into a form that the computer can accept as input. Consequently, executable code is in a form that is interpretable by a computer, but completely scrambled from the perspective of anyone, even for the computer programmer who wrote the code in its uncompiled form. And most commercial applications are distributed as executables and not as source code. And the free and open source software movement argues that source code should be included. But most of the computer language that is distributed today is distributed in an obfuscated form, illegible even to computer scientists. Its illegibility is the fifth major difference that distinguishes computer language from human language. Instantaneous. Well, I'll halt this list with one more addition. Uh, a, a sixth difference between prose and programs. Computer programs are essentially instantaneous in two respects. The clock speeds of most contemporary computers are timed in gigahertz. That is to say, one statement from a computer takes about one billionth of a second to execute. Now, consider some action that we can do quickly, such as blink an eye. An eye blink happens on the order of hundredths of a second. In other words, software actions occur tens of millions of times faster than the fastest of human actions. Now consider how fast computer languages can move. Two computers connected with fiber optic cables can exchange commands at the speed of light. Again, orders of magnitude faster than we can manage to exchange winks, or at least process them. Usually, these almost instantaneous speeds of computers and networks are seen to be good things. After all, services like two-way video over the internet would be impossible otherwise, but others, especially Paul Virilio in his examination of the destructive possibilities of speed and investigation, he terms dromology, emphasizes the dangers of instantaneous speed. Imagine the US Navy deploys a guided missile cruiser to the Strait of Hormuz that is outfitted with a computerized combat information center that contains a bug, an error that leads the computer to mess misrecognize an Iranian passenger flight as a combat aircraft. The commander of the cruiser shoots down the passenger flight and kills all 290 people aboard. Or imagine that most of the trading in financial markets is mediated by software making decisions autonomously or semi-autonomously according to financial models that are computer-based simulations of current and past market conditions. Virilio's point is that technologies of instantaneous speed ones that work on a time scale immensely faster than human speed can be the cause of enormous accidents. So programs are very different from prose. Computer programs are imperative, autonomous, impersonal, infinitesimal, illegible, and instantaneous in ways that no previous forms of writing, 
Moreover, no previous medium in general has been. This list of six differences only begins to scratch the surface of these deep divides. But even this short enumeration reminds us that rewriting the world entails a vast transformation, a transformation at least as profound as ancient Greece was undergoing at the time of Plato. When the old oral and poetry based society was lost to a society governed by laws, science and art written in prose. From poetry to prose, now we move from prose to programs. There's nothing intrinsically wrong with procedural epistemology or what my colleague at UCSC, Michael Matias, has called procedural literacy. What's wrong is its universal application. Seeing the world as a nail to be pounded simply because one has a hammer is a form of insanity, despite the fact that hammers are good tools for certain applications. So this move from prose to programs is further compounded by other legal and cultural forces. In many countries of the Western world, literacy rates of 80 to 90 percent are not unusual. But these literacy rates reflect prose literacy, not program literacy. In comparison, literate programmers, like the ones championed by Donald Knuth, are a select elite. As our world is rewritten, we live in an age akin to early modern Europe, when only a tiny fraction of the population was literate. Our priests and scribes are programmers, and as our economic, legal, and political system become more increasingly entangled with computer code, the issue of computer literacy of the larger population increasingly becomes a question of human rights. Where is the Paolo Freire of software? Consider also that many computer codes are illegal to read, even if illiteracy and illegibility can be overcome. For example, the code that controls the AccuVote TS vote screen um, voting terminals manufactured by Diebold Company, um, Dark Matter, um, he printed out all of the, the Diebold code um, and then blacked out what you couldn't read, which is more or less everything. <laughs> Um, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act is another law that also censors the reading and writing of certain kinds of computer code. The DMCA is a United States copyright law that criminalizes the creation of decoding software. For example, software that might be used to copy a DVD containing copyrighted materials, even when there is no infringement of copyright itself. In short, the DMCA makes it illegal to make illegible codes legible, even if it is technically possible to do so. <clears throat> so, not quite there. The challenges of software studies are formidable and pressing because the rewriting of the world is happening quickly and globally. Multiply the imperative, autonomous, impersonal, infinitesimal, illegible, and instantaneous characteristics of computer code by the cultural and legal conditions of illiteracy, copyright, and patent laws, and one is faced with a Gordian knot. So, where do we start cutting? or at least untangling. Engineering would have us start with the devices themselves, the computer programs and networks that affect this rewriting of our ideas and everyday life. Social science and the humanities would have us start with the people to find out what sorts of social impacts these new technologies are having. I suggest we start at both ends at once by considering the algorithms, the processes that are enacted sometimes by people, sometimes by machines, and sometimes by cybernetic couplings between the two. <coughs> Moreover, since software is a language of processes, a language for the description of step-by-step how-to knowledge of procedural epistemology, it seems most likely that the greatest changes of digital ideology and digital life will be affected as rewritten processes. So what kind of work am I suggesting? And this is sort of where I get to my question for you all. Cultural studies has long been amenable to theorizing culture as a process rather than as a thing. And so I do not think there is any intrinsic problem with pursuing software studies as a kind of cultural studies. I mean, cultural studies stand in for a lot of stuff right now. Um, media studies, science and technology studies, a variety of things. But However, cultural studies is a diverse practice, and articulating software studies this way makes at least two projects possible. In one, software studies would be more or less indistinguishable 
from what's been called internet studies, cyber cultural studies, and so forth. Fields in which the bulk of the effort entails an examination of popular cultural forms of digital life. For example, there's a lot of interesting work on free culture, open source software, Facebook, Wikipedia, computer gaming that's largely concerned with how people and society are affected by these new technologies. This has also been the main concern of the legal scholars, um, Larry Lessig, uh, Bankler, Sunstein, so forth, um, and a set of journalists too, Clay Shirky, Julian DeBell, Steve Johnson, and others. I, I think the best of this work, um, if I going to venture to characterize um, what some of the work's going on here. Um, some of the best of this kind of work is done here um, at USC. And I, I guess I'm especially grateful for um, the November report that you all issued on living and learning with new media and then the online book. Uh, the other possibility of pursuing software studies as cultural studies is to examine what Stuart Hall in a 1982 essay termed the rediscovery of ideology, colon, the return of the repressed in media studies. And so in my terms, the other option is what I described as digital ideology. An ethnographic study of digital life necessarily marginalizes the description of the digital ideology that frames it. And you might disagree with me. I'd be interested in. Oh, so you're going to LA. What are you going to talk about? I said software. He said, oh, you lost me right there. <laughs> Didn't want to hear anything about it. To study digital ideology, I'm going to insist, one needs to read code. Not because the entire ideology is embedded in the code, but because a non-trivial portion of it is. To try to attempt such a study without the necessary procedural literacy would be akin to embarking on a career in legal studies without knowing how to read case law or akin to tackling French literature but by reading it all in translation. Yes, perhaps it is the case that nothing is lost in translation, but you don't know how good your translator is unless you can exercise that skill too. To study digital ideology, one needs to write code as well as to read it. This is a matter, this is my like a third point of methodology, I guess. This is a matter of rhetorical efficiency. If one cannot write in the language of a debate, one cannot hope to have much of a say. The unit of exchange in the world of software is the program. I mean, if I go to Silicon Valley and say, I have a good idea, they say everybody has good ideas. Show me the working code. One extraordinary work of software studies done before the phrase was invented, and this was Phil Agri's book called Computation and Human Experience. Um, in which he examines the subfield of computer science, artificial intelligence. Uh, in his introduction, Agri points out how this project differs from science studies. So Phil writes that the peculiarity of my project might also be illustrated by a comparison with Paul Edwards' outstanding recent history of artificial intelligence. Um, and that book is called The, the Closed World, 90, 1996. Um, in the language of social studies of science, of technology, Edwards opposes himself to internalist studies that explain the progress of a technical field purely through the logic of its ideas or the economics of its industry. He observes that internalist studies have acquired a bad name from their association with the sort of superficial self-justifying history that Kuhn lamented in his analysis of quote normal science. In response to this tendency, Ed positions his work as counter history drawing out the interactions among cultural themes, institutional forces, and technical practices that previous studies had inadvertently suppressed. So I'm still, I'm still quoting from uh, Agri. While I, Agri, applaud this kind of work, I've headed in an entirely different direction. This book is not only an internalist account of research in artificial intelligence, it is actually a work of AI, and an interventionist intervention within the field that contests many of its basic ideas while remaining fundamentally sympathetic to the computational modeling as a way of knowing. Phil summarizes his approach with a phrase. He says, what is needed, I will argue, is a critical technical practice. A technical practice for which critical reflection upon the practice is part of the practice itself. Now, one could argue 10 years after Agri's book was published that indeed his work was accepted as a work of AI and in fact seen as a seminal and transformative work, especially in the area of planning. Um, 
but it was not his book that was seen as the work. It was a series of technical papers he published prior to the book that had the desired status. His book, per se, was read with interest by those of us who also read critical cultural and media studies. But the world of computer science didn't read his book, or rather did not read his book since he has edited several, did not read that particular book because he's, he's edited several other books. The question is software studies, cultural studies, or science studies, or media studies, or is it computer science? This question is both an intellectual question and a question about institutions. Can someone who writes about the cultural implications of technology thrive in a computer science department? Can someone who writes code thrive in a media studies center? Ten years ago, the answer to both questions was no, and today I think it's an open question. So rather than draw a sharp distinction between studies of digital life and studies of digital ideology, this distinction that I've been insisting on throughout the presentation, rather than do that, it's probably better to understand this distinction as a difference of register and reception. In other words, our discussions of literacy take place with particular groups of people who use certain languages in distinct manners. When new literacies emerge, recursively, our discussions about literacy need to change and diversify, if only to address new and emerging publics. Writing that is compelling, writing that is compelling within computer science is not necessarily so for cultural anthropology and vice versa. Thus, my, my, thus the studies of digital ideology and digital life are not different endeavors. Rather, my suggestion is that software studies might simply be an interesting supplement or complement to the studies of digital life that have been accomplished here at USC. Thank you. I got some URLs. We, we put the whole um, UC San Diego software studies thing up on YouTube. Um, so that's one of the URLs. But if you just look for software studies, like I think it's all one term or something like that. Uh, on YouTube. On YouTube. So that, uh, there's a bunch of that up there. Um, one of the participants, uh, Matthew Kirschenbaum, he wrote an article for the Chronicle of Higher Education about this area a couple days ago. So um, he kind of articulates that. And then MIT Press, that's, that's just the, the pointer to the MIT Press um, bookstore. But I mean, part, the other side of this, what I think of as sort of the, the coding side of this kind of work, um, for me ends up sometimes writing computer programs that um, get accepted as science and sometimes it's get, they get accepted as art. So I'm going to talk about more about that um, tomorrow. So I've got some stuff up at SFMOMA right now, um, the Whitney the walker, um, different places like that. So those are pointers to that, that stuff. Um, yeah. I, I, I was really struck by your point about code being illegible. I mean, the idea of studying something that's illegible when you want to understand it. And, and I was wondering if you could maybe expand a little bit on this. And it's actually the extent to which that study can be inclusive of, of various people, various literacy, various uh, understanding of the code. Do you have any suggestions about practices to make this legible, uh, collaborations between experts and non-experts, the ways in which you can engage people who may not be programmers in, in uh, participating in studying what the, what the code is doing? Well, I, I really think that um, that's what the open source movement, a lot of it is about. Um, my former PhD student, now a research scientist at Xerox PARC, uh, Nicolas Ducheneau, did a really nice PhD where he took, um, he, we looked at open source software not the way a lot of economists do as this sort of marvelous form of production, but as a learning environment, as a place where people come in, they're not necessarily rank amateurs because you can't really do anything unless you can code, but you come in uh, relatively inexperienced and then maybe you, you stay for quite a while. By the time you leave, if you leave, um, you've learned a lot of stuff. And so what Nicola's dissertation was about, and this was at the, the information school at Berkeley, was like, how does one get um, really uh, over the course of time 
um, enrolled in sort of Latourian science studies terms or imbricated, interweaved in the networks of both code and discussion that constitute a project. And I, I thought that was a really different image about what open source is about. Although for certain open source projects, like the Python programming language, they're very uh, like um, thoughtful about that idea. They, they do have certain, for example, discussion forums open strictly where um, people are taking intro programming classes can come and ask like the head of the project, like what's this iterator thing? Or <laughs> just, just stuff like that. And they, they have a really nice response. So a lot of it has to do with dialogue, I think has to do with establishing that dialogue um, and thinking about a dialogue in which code is, is woven into it and having an image of that um, and trying to understand that. I, I also think that, that that's, that's why I mentioned the constructivist approach. I mean, you know, Alan Kay's work, um, Seymour's, Papert's work, and so forth, have really been attempts to, to try to um, think about this as, as a problem of, of literacy, I think, and of transformation in media. And I, I think by building new, I mean, both Seymour and Alan's kind of approach has been to like build new programming languages. It's kind of been the way, I, I don't know if that's the best way to go about it, but I, I find their writings on it quite uh, thoughtful. But you know, it's, it's, like, it's like as though we lived in the day of Caesar, you know. Caesar, Caesar wrote, um, when he went and he came, he saw, and he conquered, he probably wrote a note back to Rome to say, hey, I came, I saw, I conquered. He probably wrote it in Latin. Now, there is a code that Caesar used, which was to take, um, just shift by one letter or two letters, one way or the other. So if, if, it, if it was an A, he'd use a B and so forth. So a little bit of encoding. Caesar was up on that. But even if he'd written it out, um, in an unobfuscated form, if it had gotten captured partway to Rome, chances are it would have been captured by somebody who couldn't read it anyway. So we're kind of living in that, in that day where, yeah, there's obfuscation going on, and yeah, you can, you can buy a reverse compiler to get some of that stuff, but in the larger picture, it doesn't really matter uh, so much because everybody's illiterate, relatively speaking. Um, in this particular form. Now, I'm, I'm being a little bit provocative, I know, <laughs> thing, but, but that's where I, I'm trying to start a conversation here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll jump into the break Good. since you're inviting me. <laughs> um, no, I, I think that I, I mean, a lot of the software studies movement that's going on right now because I've always felt that there hasn't been enough attention to reading and analyzing code at the actual technical layer, and that science and technology studies has always sort of made gestures to it, but because the, the actual Special specialization and literacy needed to be able to do that is so incredibly obscure and challenging to people and exclusionary that it hasn't really taken off as a practice until I think your group is starting to coalesce it as a movement in a new way. So I buy the agenda overall. I think the thing that I would want to push on is I think what Francois was sort of getting at is that there's all kinds of obscure things that you need training to read. And like ethnography is a version of that, or like institutional analysis. Like there's a lot of things that just in modern life become black box and illegible. And software is, I agree, a particularly central set of black box stuff that is particularly illegible, humanly illegible, and particularly, um, it's sort of both extremely illegible and also extremely structuring. So it's important. Um, on the other hand, it's like sort of the notion of translate. So there's this idea which I think you were suggesting with open source is that, okay, you need to train people to be more literate in this, which, re which brings people to more critical awareness, presumably, and, you know. But you're, because it's such a technical and exclusionary practice, to me that doesn't seem like it's ever going to be a solution to broad-based literacy and awareness. I mean, it's hard for me, like you look at who are actually part of the open source community, and it's certainly not, um, it's open source but not openly accessible to a lot of people. And so the question is, given sort of the reality factor, I think there, 
the question of translation, people who stand in between, and what's good enough in terms of being able to read code critically. Or I mean, that's sort of where I'm just as an educator and a practical issue. It's like, OK, I'm just happy if kids can figure out, look at the terms of service of Facebook. You know, I'm not mm -hmm. expecting them to be open source developers. But it's like they don't even know what it means to upload something on YouTube in terms of their ownership of that content, for example. And so there's, and that's where, like, I wonder if people who are reading certain parts of social life or institutional life or culture, people who are, you know, you have, well, is it media studies? Is it cultural studies? Is it computer science? That it's actually software is implicated in all of those. Like the code itself is not going to tell you how it's embedded in these other layers. And that you actually have to be able to do some sort of interdisciplinary cross analysis across these highly technical domains to understand the shape of modern life, even just the shape of how software is structuring modern life. So just like I totally agree, like analyzing culture in isolation or analyzing practice in isolation is not going to get you there if you don't understand the code. I'm just suggesting that the inverse is also true. Right. Well, that's where I want to end, with, is with sort of these yeah. endeavors being complementary or supplementary to a variety of other endeavors. And I, I, I do think that um, one, as an educator, faces this directly in its most pragmatic form, I think. I, I teach a, you know, a lecture class with 120 like, undergraduates introduction to digital media. It's about writing about digital media. But I want them not, at the very least, not be intimidated by code. So I have them do some exercises with that. So they can look at a page of code and change one thing and see, oh, I just made Pong do something totally different. Um, that's what I'm aiming at yeah. for them. And I, and I think there is this, there's discussion of like, you know, how much is enough. Any, but, but ultimately any literacy is a, is a kind of um, reflection as well of some kind of um, social economic advantage. And I, I think my point here is, is really that people at the top of the heap in a lot of uh, fields right now have this like fluency with this particular thing. It would be like, you know, being an old style diplomat and not knowing French, that just wouldn't work. Um, so there is, there's a question of how much is enough, but then there's, there's, a, there's a question uh, of, well, you know, what, what kinds of economic political uh, difference is being produced through educating, let's say, to this point and not, and no further, or, uh, or Whatever. I mean, you, I, I, as I understand the Institute for Multimedia Literacy, you all are doing this on a very practical basis here, right? You're trying to get students to produce these things that are very complicated computational artifacts. Um, and I, I think we all have to come to terms, especially when we've got students uh, under our care. Like, well, how do we, how do, we do this? I, I'm, I'm struggling with this on the one hand, because I, I, I think on, on the one hand, um, like, it's the, we 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 have to extend this discussion of literacy to to fluency as well and other things. I mean, I, I give this talk to humanities people, and they say, "Well, if I if I if I get one of those books out of Borders, like Java in 20 days, am I going to be okay then?" Um, and I and, and my response is, "Well, you know, there's the why, right next to that." section at borders is the like foreign languages things and and so it's like french in 20 days is that enough <laughs> that'll work fine if you're just like going to be a tourist in paris for a couple of days um otherwise it won't so I, I i think um it's a difficult question yeah Thank you. 
No, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of thinking about this in terms of, let's say, uh, Ivan Illich, when he, his book, ABC, The Alphabetization of the World, um, where he's talking, you know, simultaneously about institutions, uh, individual skills, and um, sort of local knowledges, and, and how these, these things interact one together. So I, I, I prefer to see this sort of historically. Uh, I mean, another touchstone for me would be Eric Havelock's book on the preface to Plato, where he's talking about the fact that, you know, written language got introduced to Greece about 700 BC or so, but it wasn't really until Plato's time that it became a thing that, let's say, you do as a philosopher. Otherwise, that was kind of dirty work if you're a philosopher. And it's like Plato seems to think that maybe he's not as good as a philosopher as Socrates because Socrates didn't write and he, like, reduced himself to doing so. Um, I think it's, you know, it is a, it's a cognitive shift and a cultural shift at, at the same time. So. Um, I'm sorry if I gave that impression. I think it's, the, the questions are difficult because it is sort of, when you talk about literacy, it is a values and norms sort of question mm -hmm. about what you think is important for participation and contemporary culture, basically. Right. And I think that's where the software thing is really, and the media literacy thing has really been challenging. And I feel like at USC, there's been a lot of effort to push for, you know, it's media literacy, but it's a certain kind of literacy, I mean, it's sort of the sort of reference, you know, I, I know that Steve and Colin don't necessarily, you know, represent this origin story of IML, but, you know, it was a lot based on, you know, framed as Lucas saying that there really needs to be a new generation of visual literacy and that it's about acknowledging the role of popular culture and that's mm -hmm. also a value, a very strong sort of values contestation between what counts as valuable forms of culture, and, and then the, I've seen the software studies movement as also part of that values debate about the fact that you can't be living in this world and be totally clueless about code, that that's just wrong. There's sort of a, there is a kind of literacy, a basic literacy argument embedded in that as well as an agenda for research, I think, and then, or, or that's how I interpret it as a, somebody who's working in then I think where it gets really tricky to, for me at, at a really practical and sort of personally defensive level is that when you're in, it's so interdisciplinary, right? Because we're working at the margins of different areas and it's not like you can just drill deep into one thing and say, okay, this is the canon. It's not like French. You can't say, this is the set of skills, this is the canon. You know, you, you get from here to there, beginner to expert and you're done. It's like you're cobbling together all these different things and it's like a really practical question, like the kids in the IML, do they need to know how to code? Or is it more important that you spend time teaching them how camera, camera angles structure a visual argument? It's a really different kind of focus for an educational experience. And that, for me, personally, and I tend to work as a connector across multiple areas and disciplines and literacy, so I never go deep into everything. Like, I'm not a geek. I mean, <laughs> but, like I don't geek out on things. I kind of translate and synthesize things, and it's very. I find it very, very <coughs> difficult to get like deeply into the literacy and fluency of a particular domain, and that in a way that's another form of fluency is that you you know enough, or you understand who you you need you know who you need to go to for certain forms of help, and it's. It has real significant implications for how you structure education, I think. Yeah. No, I, I think, um, you know, when I, when I took French, I got these set of books, the Becherel, which give you the grammar and, like, the, I can't remember, but, the, you know, there's, there, there really are reference works that you have the idea that if I just mastered these reference works, then I could just, I'd be free, I'd be done. Um, of course, it doesn't really work like that. <laughs> but I think that's, that's the way we've seen a lot of education, is step-by-step -step education. And I, I, I really think, um, I mean, uh, on a pragmatic level, the way I see this as an educator, um, I see my own work, but also I see a lot of work um, that hadn't traditionally uh, been taught this way, 
going this way. And this way is towards a, a kind of studio uh, project-based work. Where if you've got a project to do, the notion of, oh, I have to learn this and this and this and this in order to get that done um, is motivating. And also, it's circumscribing. You don't have to learn everything about French to be able to ask for a baguette at the baker's. Um, you just you need to know this particular little piece. Um, and if you really get into that, you'll do another series of projects. Um, and you will like be able to piece those things together. I, I really think, um, I mean, this is the way engineering's going towards a kind of more studio model, kind of um, critique kind of analysis. This is the way architecture has always been. Um, this is the way that I tend to run my classes, just because um, I think that we're at a moment of, of interdisciplinarity, whether we like it or not. I mean, it just seems like all the really important problems, um, global climate change, whatever, you can't say, oh, that's, you know, that's your problem. <laughs> it's not just your problem. It's like everybody's problem. So all the big problems, all the important problems entail traversing these disciplines. And we do have a model of education that allows that, which is atelier, studio, whatever you want to call it. And um, that it, it's, it also entails, then a question comes up, and, and this comes up, I, I think, again. Do you want students to, to cross train, or do you want them to be like specialists on a team, right? And so, um, I don't know, I've, I've done a lot of organizing around Santa Cruz, thinking about new media programs, comparing them to other places or whatever like that. But like, you know, uh, Janet Murray at Georgia Tech says, okay, there's this technical aspect to this new degree around digital media, and there's this cultural, social, humanistic. Um, when you come in, maybe you only know one, but by the time you go out, we're gonna ask you to cross train. You've gotta do both sides, and you've gotta, gotta work. You, you have to at least know what the other side is. Then there's like um, the CMU program, Interactive Entertainment, uh, that Randy Pausch and the other folks are running for a long time. Um, they more or less say, you know, you're gonna come in an expert and a specialist, and you're gonna go out an expert and a specialist. And what you're gonna learn when you're here is how to work with people and with different expertise, but we're not gonna ask you, let's say as a coder, to also be a, a great like figure drawer or something like that. That's, that's someone else's job. You just have to learn how to respect and how to like work with people across that. And I, I think those are both completely workable strategies. Um, but it does entail something different in education than what we've done before. And I, I think what we've done before is say, you know, recruited students at least on the university level to like our disciplines, train them up, you know, you are a perfect X, whatever that discipline is, um, and send them out the door with very well-defined goals, um, places to publish, people to work with, um, accolades that they should aim for. And th that's just not the, m that's not the model anymore. In fact, that's dysfunctional right now. And I, I see this kind of dysfunctionality um, in, uh, it comes down, especially in an older uh, generation, um, to uh, a lack of respect across disciplinary boundaries. I mean, I'm kind of at Santa Cruz between all these things. So. Um, <laughs> Okay. You know, no, but you know, you go talk to a, you talk to a natural scientist. You get, put together like somebody who works in the library all the time, like humanities person, and somebody like a natural scientist who spends their work time in the lab. <clears throat> and I've heard this come out of the mouth of like a natural scientist. Like, so what do you do? Well, I write books about the history of whatever. And they say, so, yeah, but what do you do? What's your work? Because writing for me isn't work. Writing's what I do after I finish my work, right? My work is in the lab, and then I write stuff up. So that's, and that sounds kind of funny, but when it comes to, like, when that person is making a tenure decision about this other person, like, it's a mess. Um, and I, I think that, that sort of, if nothing else, um, I think this new world entails um, coming up with some working relationship. Maybe you cross train, or maybe you just respect what the other people are doing, but you gotta, you gotta be able to do it together. <coughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, 
so I think you've actually spoken to most of the questions that I have. And I, have I have all these, I have a hundred really selfish kind of institutional <laughs> program building, field building questions um, for you, because the IMAP program I think is very much aligned with a lot of the things you're talking about. I know you guys are working on a similar program, program up there. Um, and it's something that we definitely struggle with both in the MFA program and the interactive media and the PhD program. And, I kind of, and so we just went ahead and put in a programming requirement in the PhD program. It's just like, yes, before you leave here, you will have to engage this in a deep way. Um, but we struggled with how to do that. And I think what Holly's question was sort of pointing at was the entry into that expert discourse, that the idea of a PhD program is that you actually do leave with an expert, an expertise that allows you to kind of plan the field with people who are the best in that field. Um, but software studies, or software programming, I think resists that at every level because it's all about sort of like, you know, bubbling to the top and, and you know, and becoming amazing, not just becoming literate or competent. Um, so I wonder just, you know, how you imagine implementing that in terms of kind of curriculum, um, also because of the incredible proliferation of platforms and mm -hmm. being great at Python mm -hmm. versus Java versus C++, so there's also hierarchies among those, and let's what's cool, what's core, what's kind of, you know, trivial, does action script count, you know, all of those kinds of questions, which for me are less interesting, I think, because of the, um, I wrote down a lot and said about what's important is the impact on the thinking habits of those who use the tool. Um, and so I wonder where, what you think about, um, one of the things we've been kicking around is the idea of pseudocode and kind of teaching programming that isn't necessarily about making something that's executable, but something that teaches those, those concepts. Mm -hmm. Or does that just fall at the very bottom, the bottom part of the hierarchy? I don't. I don't think so. I mean, I. I, I think what. Um, I think the best way. Let's say we do go the route of respect rather than mastery of the other side. That is, then I think the best way to get respect is to like, dip in to that somewhat to sort of get at least a taste for what other people are doing. So I would count that as as a very good strategy for getting respect for what the other side um, is doing. I mean, um, the whole history of, of art and technology, for example, is, is littered with, with terrible battles of disrespect. Again, like where the artists say, you go away and implement what I came up with. And the designer saying, what do I need an, uh, an artist for? Like, I could do all this stuff without your stupid ideas. Um, but then you've got other people in the history of art um, who've engaged with the, with the ideas without necessarily doing it in the mater exact material form. So I, I would say Sol LeWitt's uh, practice is a good example of this. So he's an artist, conceptual artist, working in the 60s until he just died, I guess it was the year before last. Um, but you can read his work as a kind of art of industrial production or post-industrial production because what he did, right, is he typed up little instructions, things like um, 1,000 circles all partly overlapping. Um, that was his art, period, right? It was a, more or less a set of instructions about how to do a drawing. And then he handed it to other people who then did it. And um, what's, in, what's interesting about the art, in my mind, is not even necessarily that he more or less was writing code, neither is it that um, it comments on industrial production because he had someone else do it, but actually how he practiced that, which is he got a bunch of younger artists, usually, to be his assistants, and then he worked his butt off to introduce those younger assistants to famous curators and stuff, and they end up being famous artists themselves. So someone like Adrian Piper was one of his assistants at a certain point, right? And so that's a totally reworking of kind of management labor relationship that you see in industrial post-industrial production that's like reworked in almost the invisible side of the, the art practice. Um, so what I, I, I try to employ these kinds of examples in my teaching and to get my students to think about well, what is procedural epistemology? What would that term mean at all? It means talking about how to do something step by step, step by step, how to do it. Um, how would you write that out? I have, so, um, pseudocode is one way to do that. Um, a lot of other things. That said, you know, there's, there's all kinds of, that, I think that's, the, that's, that's one step. There's all kinds of ways we can go from there. And yes, action script does count because it's, uh, it's EMCA script and it's got closures and it's got lambda and it's got all the sort of beautiful things of, 
of the best computer languages. <laughs> I think we should continue over lunch. Um, where is this lunch next door? Oh, next door. OK. So please join us so we can have a more interactive discussion. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.